It's good to uh, be with you all on this first Sunday of the season of Lent, and uh, wonderful to have um, our younger choir members uh, lead us in worship today. Thank you all for that. It's beautiful. So we're told by the Gospels that Jesus was tempted. The one who is God with us in the flesh, um, friend, teacher, Savior, Lord, way and presence, and all the other ways we experience Jesus, he was tempted. Tempted to deny his identity as God's beloved and to reject his vocation of teaching and embodying the kingdom, God's hope and dream for the world. Tempted to engage the world and those around him, not with love, but by pursuing power, efficiency, and control. Jesus, however, as the story unfolds, and as we'll see, walks a different path. Now, uh, there is a lot of anxiety and uncertainty in our world. And what anxious people in anxious systems in an anxious world do is they seek to, understandably, eliminate or, or manage that anxiety by exercising power, efficiency, and control. Because power, efficiency, and control seem preferable to the more risky way of love. The more uncertain way, in fact, of love. Because the way of love, the way of Jesus, requires trust. It makes us vulnerable. It requires our letting go of the idea that we can somehow determine the outcome by exercising power, efficiency, and control over the situation. Jesus, in fact, uh, invites us to follow a different way. And the way of Jesus requires trust requires trust. Um, Jesus, in the temptations that we encountered um, from this reading from Matthew, in fact, is, is, is tempted to pursue the way that we see embodied in Caesar and the other political leaders of his day. Uh, the, the way of kingdoms built by coercive power. Um, the way we often, unfortunately, even order the life of the church but recognizing that that way is a zero-sum game in which there are uh, everyone is either a winner or a loser, Jesus goes a different way, a different direction, follows a better path, a way from life, from death to life, and life to the full. A way that, of course, will ultimately lead him to the cross, which is, in fact, an instrument of and a symbol of our world's desire to control the outcome by what? By power, efficiency, and control. That's what the cross was about. Meredith shared, uh, Pastor Meredith shared on Ash Wednesday that Lent is in part about learning this different way, about following the path of descent, of letting go of things like power, efficiency, control, um, and the need for precision and clarity and trusting the God who holds the future. Because no matter how well laid our plans might be, if they are within our power to accomplish, if by our efficient systems of power we can, can control the outcome, then those plans are not of God. If we can pursue the vision and mission that we are given as a church, apart from God, under our own power and strength, by our own effort and cleverness and intelligence, then the vision and mission that we think has come from God actually has its origin somewhere else. And it is less than God's hope and dream for the world. Because only the power that raises the dead um, can affect God's dream, God's hope for the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it comforting that Jesus was tempted, is like us, shares our humanity, that he could have 
He could have chosen the path of efficiency. He could have tried to exert power over others. He could have tried and controlled the outcome. I find it comforting that for a moment, maybe he thought about it. Maybe. That there was within his flesh that part of me and of us that is prone to rely on our our own abilities. And then we, we invite God in to bless what we've already accomplished. So we follow one who is like us in every way. Jesus was tempted. And yet Jesus' temptations are, in fact, unique to him. Turning stones into bread, um, obtaining the, 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 the kingdoms of this world, putting God to the test by a showy display of God's power, So we find ourselves here at the beginning of Lent, beginning our annual journey to the cross and then to Easter and beyond. And I wonder, what does Jesus' dusty wilderness experience really say to us, the church? Some 2,000 years later, how does it inform our life together as we seek to be the faithful people of God? What do His temptations have to do with you and me and the ways in which maybe we are at times also tempted to deny who we're called to be, to reject the vocation we've been given. I've been a pastor for um, a while. (laughs) I had a birthday yesterday. Um, And someone said I was 29, which um, was wonderful. I don't believe that. But um, anyway, 29. And then I started to do the math about how many more than 29 I was. Like, oh, boy, I should stop because that's depressing. But um, almost 30 years, almost three decades of being a pastor, all kinds of churches in all sorts of places filled with all kinds of people. And it's never been easy being the church together because the church can be messy. People, it's because it's filled with people and people are messy um, at times. And whether you're a pastor or a layperson seeking to be a faithful part of the church, Um, having some responsibility or leadership or or, uh, a member that serves and gives of your time and your energy, striving to be faithful, following Jesus, the path of Jesus, the way of Jesus can be a difficult path. It is, after all, a cross-shaped journey. So that shouldn't surprise us. And over the years, I have been to numerous leadership experiences, read the books, been encouraged to develop certain skills, competencies I've seen, as I know our other pastors have, countless leadership initiatives come and go that were going to fix the church. And all of it was, of course, well-intentioned, and, and some of it even important uh, in a, in, as we try to lead and be the church faithfully and well. That said, we find ourselves in a moment in the church's history with a unique set of challenges and opportunities. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately as we imagine um, our future um, as a congregation, giving thanks for the the, the rich history that we have and share together, and then imagining where God might be calling us next. And, And I'm aware that our world is more complex than ever before, that the church occupies a much more marginal place in that world, that we face the headwinds of unhealthy politics and economic uncertainty and instability in different parts of the world, denominational issues, the ongoing decline in participation in in the institutional church. And of course, all of this sort of um, laid on top of all of that is the past couple of years with the COVID pandemic. And so these are the turbulent waters in which we are swimming and striving to faithfully be the church. And there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty in us, in the system, and in the world around us. And it's tempting, friends, because we're, we're relatively intelligent, competent, hardworking people. It is tempting to believe that we can just go fix it, to rely on ourselves by pursuing power, efficiency, and control. We're tempted, like Jesus, to deny who we are, to reject our calling, to go our own way. 
Now, in these turbulent waters, we need healthy, competent, skilled people, of course. And yet I'm increasingly aware that more than that, what we need and what we've really always needed is more than technical solutions and expertise. In this season, the challenges and opportunities in front of us to be the church and to follow Jesus so closely that, as Meredith said on Wednesday, we get the dust of our rabbi kicked up on us. To follow Jesus in a way that makes a difference in the world, that lightens the burdens others are carrying, that helps them move from fear to freedom and to life. It requires more than, than our efficient solutions our our attempts to control the outcome or exert a little power here and there. Henry Nouwen notes in his wonderful book, In the Name of Jesus, the question is not how many people take you seriously or how much are you going to to accomplish or can you show some results? Those were the kinds of questions the tempter was was putting to Jesus in the wilderness. The, The real question. And the one Jesus seemed to be pointing us to in his response and his rejection of those temptations is simply, do we know and love God? Do we, Davidson United Methodist Church, know the heart of God? And is one of our primary goals, if not the primary goal, cultivating a transformational relationship with Christ? Because in in this world of loneliness and despair, there is an enormous need for people who know the heart of God. A heart that forgives, a heart that cares, a heart that reaches out, a heart that wants only to give love. And that consistently and concretely announces and reveals that God is love. And that every time we see fear or isolation or despair to begin to invade the lives of others, we can can without hesitation say that is not of God. Jesus' response to the temptations that he faced are a reminder that the most important gifts that we actually need are not efficiency, power, and control, but confession and forgiveness, prayer and silence, listening, paying attention, The work required is less about linear decision-making and more about the slow and patient work of discernment. That is, adopting a posture of attentiveness to God, paying attention to where God is already at work in the world, because God is, joining God in those places, and then releasing the outcome, trusting God with the outcome. Lent's a gift. It's a gift of some time and space to seek the heart of God, to pray and to worship, to listen, to study, to reflect upon our life with Christ. It's a time to be honest about the ways that we've rejected God's hope and dream for for us and for the church and for the world, to draw near to the heart of God that we might be filled anew with God's love, God's perfect love. It's a season in which we're invited again to devote ourselves to following in the way of Jesus, to living a cross-shaped life, to having those parts of us which are opposed to God's will and way put to death, if you will, buried with Christ in order that God might then raise us to new life, abundant life. Um, Ultimately, the temptations that Jesus faced, unique as they were to him, are about love and trust. And in that way, our temptations are similar to his. In this this anxious and uncertain time, as we seek to faithfully be the church of God for others, in a way that makes a real and lasting difference, the question really is, whom or what do we trust? Me? Myself? My ability? my skill, my competency, your own, or the God made known to us in Christ. Later in the Gospels, Jesus, you'll remember after when we get past Easter, we'll get to this story. Jesus asks 
Peter, do you love me? And the implied question in that is, do you trust me? Do you trust me with your life? The word we often translate as believe also can mean trust. So when we talk about believing in Jesus, we mean much more than believing some things intellectually. We actually mean trusting in Jesus, giving him our heart and our life and our hand, walking as he walked, however clumsily we do it, walking in his way. For a life of faith, curiosity is not enough. Curiosity is helpful. But at some point, you have to move, even if you can't see the way forward. In in my office, hanging on the wall, there's a photograph of the Grandfather Mountain Swinging Bridge. Some of you, a lot of you probably walked across it. It's one of those days in the the Blue Ridge Mountains when the fog is about this thick. You see about that far. So you can see about a third of the way across the bridge. And then the, the, um, the, the cables that hold it up and the bridge itself just disappear. And... We may find ourselves in a situation a bit like that these days. As a nation, as a church, as a people, the way forward is unclear and uncertain. And so we're asked to trust. Mother Teresa put it this way, I will not pray clarity for you. Clarity is the crutch of the Christian. But I will pray that your trust will increase. In the wilderness, in the dusty place of anxiety and uncertainty, in the place we often live, Jesus chose trust. To remember who he was, to whom his heart belonged, and who held his future. And friends, therein begins the journey from fear to freedom and ultimately to life. Amen.